Okay. So welcome everyone to our webinar, which uh, as I mentioned, is the World War II era Provenance Research uh, webinar here at the Frick Art Reference Library. Uh, my name is Michelle McCarthy Beeler, and I'm the reference lead here at the library. And today we're going to go over um, specific web resources, uh, free web resources that are available when doing a uh, particular provenance research on this era in particular. Um, this is an introduction to provenance research of this period. So if uh, hopefully though, if you've already done some uh, similar to this, uh, there's still some takeaways for you. Um, but feel free to use the raise your hand feature um, and also the Q&A feature and the chat feature there are available to you. Um, please make sure to use the chat feature to let us know too, if you're having any sort of technological issues with Zoom. Um, also, there should be a Q&A feature available to you where you can kind of pose questions throughout the webinar that we'll answer at the very end of the presentation, probably the last five to 10 minutes. Um, and our moderator today is my colleague, uh, Lorenzo de Los Angeles, who will be uh, monitoring the Q&A, and he's also going to be available to troubleshoot Zoom with you if you have any uh, issues. Hi, I'm Lorenzo de Los Angeles. I'm the reference assistant at Frick Art Reference Library. Welcome. Uh, great, thank you, Lorenzo, for being here today as well. Uh, if we don't get to your question today, please feel free to uh, email us at library.frick.org and we can kind of go a little bit further into the nature of your question a bit. Um, in addition to that, we will be recording this webinar, but we won't be referring to any participants by name in particular, so everybody will remain anonymous. We are also going to post an evaluation form into the chat uh, feature a little bit towards the end of the webinar, just before the Q&A. And feel free to fill out the evaluation and just let us know what kind of future programmings you'd like to see at the library going forward. And with that, we will head right into today's schedule. So the introduction is going to cover uh, the goals that we set out to accomplish during the webinar, and we'll also offer a brief historical overview on Nazi confiscation activities of the period. Keep in mind, this is a very monumental topic, so we won't be able to address everything, um, but for the most basic points as much as possible, that will be useful in kind of contextualizing the resources that we'll go over. These will be included in the overview. Next, we'll go over multinational databases and national databases, and also research strategies that are useful to World War II provenance in particular, and also talk about some of the challenges associated with it. And then we'll close with a brief Q&A session as well. So the goals that we have for this session are to gain an introduction to the history of Nazi confiscation activities of the period. Um, we want to understand the unique issues concerning World War II era provenance. We also want to learn how to use these free multinational and national databases, and also to become familiar with some of these research strategies that can really aid us in finding more information about collectors, uh, artworks, um, et cetera, um, some of the archival inventories that we have as well. So World War II era provenance has its own set of unique challenges. Provenance research in general can be very interdisciplinary and World War II era in particular can require familiarity with a range of topics, including, but not limited to of course, art history, um, politics, uh, changing geographical and geopolitical boundaries, also the history of public and private collections and restitution law, which also varies by country. So that's something to keep in mind. These allow us to understand the historical circumstances in which things changed hands when conducting research. It also means using a multitude of different types of sources. So everything from archives and inventories, um, catalogs, raisonnés, and, and uh, exhibition catalogs, also museum curatorial files, and even correspondence, either between artists and dealers, collectors and dealers, um, family correspondence, and also genealogy records can really prove useful here as well. 
The Nazis often kept very meticulous records of confiscated artworks, which can give us a good idea as to how much was stolen and how much is still unaccounted for. However, misidentifications or lack of identifications altogether uh, can mean that objects really can't be traced further than to an art dealer um, at this point in time, which can make things a little bit uh, difficult um, when trying to find the original owners of objects, for example. Um, also, there's the good news, though, is that there's a lot of large scale digitization projects and very publicly accessible materials um, and many more resources available to provenance researchers now than in the past. Um, a lot of these through institutional partnerships. So with these points in mind, we can jump right into the historical overview. So art played a very prominent role in the Nazi core worldview, and its importance really influenced their treatment of artworks and individuals. Occupation of other European territories also ensured that Nazi looting agencies could confiscate artwork from private and public collections. The Nazi looting agency that we'll be focusing on today is the ERR, or the Eisenstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg. Um, but keep in mind that there were also a network of dealers who worked with the Nazis and collaborated from other countries, uh, also Aryanized art businesses that worked with the ERR and other Nazi agencies. So why did they plunder? That's something, that's uh, the main question here. And this is, uh, had, has very several different reasons. Um, they wanted to remove so-called degenerate art from Germany, uh, which would also either be uh, burned or sold to acquire more money for the Nazi war machine. Uh, they also wanted to collect items that culturally documented enemies of the Reich, uh, such as uh, communists and masons, for example. And also they wanted to collect art for proposed initiatives, such as the planned but never realized Führer Museum, which was going to be in Linz, Austria, and was going to become like the cultural center of the new Reich and the new world order. And then last but not least, they also wanted to even just plunder for the use of private collections of Nazi officials. So these confiscations generally included degenerate art and also private property of Jewish and non-Jewish in and outside of the Reich and Germany, as well as religious and state organizations. So you can see some of the categories that some of these uh, confiscations fall into. Degenerate art, as we mentioned before, Jewish populations in Germany and Austria, um, Jewish populations outside of the Reich, and even non-Jewish uh, living outside of Germany or inside of Germany as well and property belonging to organizations such as religious organizations and property of state and public collections as well. Today, we're going to focus on confiscated European art rather than Judaica, but the Nazis also looted this and even non-Western specific collections as well. So the Eisenstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, or the ERR. This was the special Nazi unit and task force that was charged with confiscating prominent Jewish collections in Nazi-occupied territories. And these territories included France, uh, Poland, the Baltic states, Italy, the Soviet Union, and even Greece. It was the main agency involved in the systematic looting of cultural treasures. It was originally established to acquire collections for the National Socialist University, which was intended to be almost like a curiosity cabinet in a lot of ways to show cultural material related to opponents of Nazi ideology, um, kind of in the new world order. It originally sought after Jewish, Masonic, and communist collections throughout the occupied territories, but eventually after the occupation of France, it also began more looting heavily non-Jewish private collections as well, which we'll see in some of the databases we'll discover. It operated out of the Jeux de Pont Museum in Paris from 1940 to 1944, and it was really there that the Nazi personnel filed, photographed, and packed collections for transport to Germany and Austria. In many cases, Hitler himself or a member of his inner circle would evaluate materials, while others were sold to buyers through collaborating dealers in neutral countries like Switzerland to raise capital. Overall, you can see uh, that about um, they looted about more than 21,000 individual objects from Jewish-owned collections. 
So let's start with multinational databases in particular. These are international portals that connect US and European museums and repositories that possess collections related to World War II era cultural property. Portals are great resources because they allow for exchanging information and initiating and joining research projects on physically disparate collections, so collections on many different um, sides of the world and continent. So the three we're going to discuss today are the IRP, or the International Research Portal for Nazi Era Cultural Property, Looted.com, uh, Art.com, and the Lost Art Database. So the first one, the IRP, uh, is an international consortium. And this is a collaboration of archival institutions with holdings about Nazi era cultural property. It exists to expand public access to archival records that have been internationally dispersed, uh, dispersed through one single portal. So essentially it's a single search uh, as we'll see. Uh, it exists to expand public access to archival collections that have been uh, internationally dispersed, as we mentioned, but we'll also kind of touch base on the institutions that are associated with it, because remember, this is a partnership uh, consortium. So you can check by the, the navigation field all the way at the top. You can see that this is uh, just the blue navigation field. You can see that there's a search, which we'll get to in a moment. But I want to highlight in particular on the upper left-hand corner, you can see an institutions tab and also a collections tab. So the institutions tab is going to be the list of partners that create, um, that possess rather archival materials that are part, that are searchable through this database. Um, but the collections tab is going to be a group of relevant databases associated with those institutions that search these collections for archival materials. So essentially the search is actually going to be searching uh, all these collections here. There are two uh, search functions. You can do the start searching or the start browsing. Really the difference between the two, um, you can see them in the middle of the page uh, highlighted in orange, is that um, the start searching feature will allow you to search through multiple databases that we saw in the collections tab in a single search. Whereas the start browsing feature, which I'll click on just to give you a taste of, allows you to browse a list of descriptions of relevant holdings at the participating institutions. And it also provides links to their respective databases uh, and finding aids. Just keep in mind, this doesn't mean that the uh, collections listed here are digitized. It simply shows you what's available and what's, uh, where these are located um, in these institutional partnerships. But if the contact information is available there, you can get in touch with the institution and arrange for reprographics if possible. Now the start searching feature is actually set up by keyword and phrase searching, which makes it a very versatile search because it allows you to search by uh, whatever piece of the puzzle you have. So you can search by collector's name, you can search by artist name, and you can even search by title of the artwork. And then just below the search field, you can see translate keywords, where it gives you the option of translating German and French words uh, as well into these um, different types of collections or in these different types of collections, for example. So you don't have to alter what you search with. So if we wanted to do a search for Rothschild, which was the name of a very wealthy uh, Jewish family in Europe that orig was originally from Frankfurt and they had a very renowned art collection. We can see uh, which databases hold the most information relevant to this search term. So on the left hand side, you can see uh, the collection. The search results are actually just going to be below the search. You can see under the collections portion, uh, the database that it's searching. So the first one is the art database of the National Fund of Austria. Below that is the Belgium Holocaust Assets Finding Aid, uh, which is an inventory for the state archives in Belgium. Um, but all the way on the right hand side, you can see the hits. The hits are going to be the number of search results for each database. So the first one, for example, we only have 18 hits for the art database, the National Fund in Austria, which is still good. This is still relevant information. But of course, just under that, um, the Belgium Holocaust Assets Fund has zero hits. This wouldn't really be relevant to us. Um, but the central collecting point um, right here in Munich, for example, has 3,640 hits. Um, so this would be a database also that we would want to kind of um, discover and search through. 
Uh, also, just below the search fields here, we have an advanced search field. And this really allows you to narrow your search even further by artist name, uh, the location associated with the artwork or artist, and also the technique of the artwork. Um, if you start writing a name, for example, let's say we want to start with uh, Vermeer, you can see that there will be like a drop down menu of different vocabularies that use this uh, term or this name. And this drop down menu really represents the controlled vocabulary that's used by the databases that can be really helpful um, to you if you're searching. Next, we have lootedart.com. So lootedart.com is the central registry of information on looted cultural property. And it's a very comprehensive repository of information that's devoted to both Nazi looting and modern efforts and research to resolve outstanding claims issues. It was established originally through the Commission for Looted Art in Europe. The website uh, looks a little bit daunting. There's a lot of text, um, but it has a wealth of international and country-specific resources that are a great way to stay up to date with current research and also restitution information. So first, we do have two databases here that I want to draw your attention to, but first I want to draw your attention to uh, this orange uh, navigation tab at the top. On the left-hand side, you can see information by country that's just below the banner. And this is a kind of a shortcut to find country specific information on national policies and guidelines, um, art trade information, national museums, and research resources. And users can also browse these uh, resources, the ones that are available, by using the list of countries on the left hand side here. And you can see there's everything from uh, resources that are specific to Albania all the way down to Yugoslavia, and then everything in between, also Korea and Latvia, um, et cetera. Next, just to the right of information by country, you have in, uh, international resources, and this is where you'll find uh, international bibliographies, uh, laws and policy guidelines, events and conferences, and research programs that really represent um, international partnerships between countries um, and kind of how they're facilitating and working with the issue of restitution and even just provenance research in general. Next, we have research resources, um, and this is where you can find general web resources on restitution cases as well, and even a list of looted property seeking owners and news reports. And then last but not least, we have claimant information located on all the way to the right, which is if you want to file a claim and info on how to host a claim as well. But if we use uh, in the upper left-hand corner, if we just select home, we can go straight to the databases. And right in the center here, you can see there's an information database and an object database. Either one of these links will take you to um, the main search page, which includes searches for each database. The, the two databases do not work in tandem with each other, and that's because they have different functions and different needs. Um, so for instance, the information database <coughs> which you can see at the top there. Um, this contains documentation from 49 countries and will also search um, laws, policies, publications, as well as archival records and resources. So you can use this database to search for documentation found on this website. It makes it a little bit easier. As you can see, they have an example for searching Austrian laws, for example, um, and et cetera. And just below that, we have the object search database. And this is really what you would use when you have um, an object in mind, of course. Uh, so this contains actually over 25,000 objects of all kinds, including paintings, drawings, antiquities, and other objects that were looted. Um, are still missing or have even been restituted from over 15 countries. So this is not just limited to uh, lost works of art. This also includes art that have that has at one time been looted uh, in World War II or after and has since been, um, been restituted. The primary methods for searching this database are through, as you can see, uh, artist, author, or maker, also the object itself with um, the title. Um, you can specify Judaica as well if that's what you're interested in, and even provenance information. 
Uh, you can use these fields again um, in tandem with each other as they're all they're all included in the object search. Um, but if you want to just focus on one particular object or one particular area, it might be good just to start with one or two rather than all three, unless you're very certain um, of the provenance, for example. But if you do want to search a particular collector, you can also add that and just search um, through the provenance field here. But again, for example, if we wanted to do a search for Vermeer, we'll search for an object that we know has since been restituted. So we can kind of see the type of information that's available through the results. Um, we can see the astronomer. Um, and then for the provenance, as I mentioned before, we'll leave this blank for now just because we want to just search by the object at first. And this will take us to the results page. And if you select details, this is going to take you to kind of a profile of the object. So we can see um, it takes us to the astronomer uh, by Vermeer, which is what we were looking for. We can see that it includes the status of the object, which is that it has since been looted, but it has since also been restituted. Um, provenance information. So we know that this is from the Rothschild collection, uh, who it was confiscated by. So that was the Eisenstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg. Um, it tells you the range in which this um, confiscation took place. And it even tells you any sort of background information on the object. So it even includes right here that Hitler had uh, actually planned for this to be included in his Linz Museum. Um, additional information will provide even more historical documentation on the painting itself as it relates to restitution uh, and confiscation, and then even source information um, that might be really useful if you're interested in finding even more information about it. And then contact if you're interested in more looted, uh, more information from lootedart.com as well. So that's lootedart.com. There's a lot of information associated with, with this website, but it's definitely, um, I encourage you to work uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, actually uh, encourage you to dive into this website because it, it does seem daunting at first, but there's a lot of useful information in it that could provide you with um, kind of a new, uh, a new avenue in which to search. Next, uh, last but not least, we have the lost art database here. So the, lart, the lost art database, excuse me, documents cultural assets that were confiscated from public institutions and private collections during the Nazi era in Germany, in particular from uh, Jewish owners as a result of persecution. And you can see that it's actually funded by the German Lost Art Foundation uh, and the German government. Uh, so the data pertaining to the items included in this database comes from a variety of different sources, which includes museum catalogs and also applications registered through individuals and entities on works of art. And what I mean by that, you can check a little bit um, just further down under this introduction. You can see that there are search requests and there are found object reports. Um, search requests are reports registered by individuals and public institutions for lost artwork that they can prove used to be in their collections, but were since lost during um, or just after the Second World War, World War II. And then found object reports are those registered by individuals and public institutions um, who have works of art in their collections whose origin is not entirely clear and that they suspect may have been acquired uh, during the Nazi era in some way. So researchers can search two different ways, um, and you can search both of these different types of requests and reports. So on the left-hand side, just under that blue um, that blue navigation bar that says lost art database, you can see that there is a search option just under basics. And that's gonna be just a simple search. That's going to be um, just a one keyword search you can use. Um, but the only caveat is that you can't specify the two different types of uh, search requests and found reports. Um, so if we were to do August Renoir, for example, just do a simple search. This is going to bring up uh, results that include um, objects by this artist. Um, but as you can see, there'll be a little bit of taste of information, um, just the inventory number, the type of object, um, et cetera. But it, the type of report, again, you won't be able to specify here. 
On the left-hand side, though, just under that search, you'll be able to select advanced search. If you select advanced search, that gives you a little bit more um, a little bit more information in which to add to your search, a couple of more fields. So you can add an actual title. You can stick with just the artist's name if you prefer. Uh, you can also include the type of object or material and technique, um, and even provenance, again, if you know the collector that's associated with it or the institution to which it used to belong, um, and also any sort of institution information. So if we were it again, if we do uh, August Renoir, we'll stick with the same search so you can kind of see the difference. Um, and then a little bit lower, just before you select search, you can specify the kind of report. So let's stick with search requests here. And you can see it gives you the two options within search requests. So you can search for um, requests that were put in for objects by August Renoir uh, that were removed through or after World War II, but also those that were seized um, under National Socialist persecution. Um, really, the difference between that two is that uh, removed through or after during World War II doesn't necessarily mean that it was confiscated by the Nazis. It could also mean uh, trophy art um, from Soviet troops as they were passing through occupied territory territories. So this is just something to keep in mind too, these sort of differentiations between the two confiscations. If we go ahead and select search, we can look at what a full results um, a result listing would look like. So this first one for ladies portrait, which we saw in our other search as well. Here you can see it gives, uh, again, more artists and object information. It lists some generic terms, art history related, so a female person, a figure. Um, the measurement is really good that this lists as well because you can take uh, the measurements and also kind of cross-reference this with other maybe auction catalogs, uh, et cetera, that might include uh, the measurements but might not include an actual photo of this object and any sort of relevant inventory numbers. Um, keep in mind that these images might be a little bit unclear for search requests because these are going to be photographs that were taken of the object prior to um, its confiscation, of course, which could have been in uh, the 1930s, for example. So um, they might not be super clear but they will be there. And then just a little bit lower, you can see contact information of individuals uh, who are looking for the object here or individuals who work for the institution. So here we can see that this object was actually requested, the search request was placed by the Kunstall Bremen uh, located in Germany. And what's great about that is on the top in the upper right hand corner, you can see uh, it says search requests. And then it also says Kunstall Brahmin, which is uh, Bremen rather, which is the institution that, as I mentioned, filed this um, search request. And if, if you select their profile, it can show you other uh, objects that they are looking for. Again, it has contact information. And then it also lists pro uh, provenance marks. So if you do have uh, this artwork in your collection, for example, you can use these um, or another artwork that you suspect may be part of this institution or may have one point been confiscated from this institution. You can use these provenance marks to kind of match it with your own object. So this database is really useful. Um, again, this is kind of working from requests that have actually been placed and found reports that have been applied to this database. So it's not going to search everything, but it will search everything that has been administered into the database or placed by an individual or an entity. Next, we'll go into national databases. So the main difference between these and multinational databases that we just looked at is that these do not search multiple databases from different countries. Each database here um, includes collection information regarding the activity of one nation. And this could be uh, a nation that's not Germany or it could be Germany itself. So we're going to search the German sales catalogs uh, through the Getty Provenance Index. Also, NARA Fold 3, uh, the Jeux de Palme database, the Degenerate Art database, and then hopefully we'll also have time for the National Fund of the Republic of Austria and the Netherlands Art Property Collection. 
So if you're a provenance researcher who's done research before, you might be familiar with the Getty Provenance uh, Index, which is a great, um, a great research database in general for provenance. Um, but uh, really what we want to focus on, and here are the German sales catalogs from about 1900 to 1945. And this is a collaborative effort of the Getty, also the Kunstbibliothek and Heidelberg University to locate, digitize, and add to the Getty Provenance Index database all German language auction catalogs from the Nazi era from about 1930 to 1945. So this resource actually digitally merges auction catalogs from over 50 libraries and museums so that users can conduct detailed searches on the provenance index and then see the digitized catalog through Heidelberg University. So altogether, it includes approximately 9,000 historical auction catalogs, mainly published in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland that have been available or made available online and in open access. So this is what the search looks like. At first, at the top, you have a keyword search that's available to you, keyword phrase searching as we've done in the past. Uh, you can also select what Getty databases um, or inventories you would like searched. Um, so you can search archival inventories, sale catalogs, and uh, two different types of stock books. For our purposes, since we're interested in the German uh, sales catalogs in particular, we're going to just exclude all the other options and leave just the sales catalogs, contents, and descriptions. You're welcome to use keywords, as I mentioned before. But um, I think this is a great opportunity if we're looking for a particular um, maybe artist or a particular sale, for example. So from here, you can search by artist um, or object information, object type. And then you can also search by events. And events mean uh, auctions or sales events uh, if that information is available to you. You'll see that there's also kind of like this browse list or browse listing um, link that's located next to each field. And this is just a corresponding list of subject vocabularies on the right that you can choose if you're unsure of the correct spelling on the data you're looking for, because a lot of these are going to be in German um, or another language. So for this, if we wanted to do uh, Picasso, Let's say we wanted to do a, a painting by Picasso. And let's say we're interested in a particular uh, auction that occurred. So we're interested in, in particular an auction that occurred in Luzerne, Switzerland in June 1939. So we know that uh, there were Picasso paintings that were included in the specific sale that we're interested in, but we don't know which ones, we don't know how many. So this is one case where you would choose Picasso, the painting. Um, if you do have the object title, you can include that. And the transaction type, let's say we're interested in those that were sold through this auction. And we'll do, we're trying to do 1938, 1939, because again, this is we're interested in a particular sale. So we could just include uh, kind of a good range that will fall, that the sale will fall within. And for the city, as I mentioned, we're interested in Luzerne. So we'll do uh, Luzerne, Switzerland here. And then if you have further information on the archival inventory and the sales catalogs, you can go ahead and add that as well. But for now, I think this is enough search terms to go ahead and we can select search from the upper right hand corner. So here you can see we have three results for three sales um, of paintings that occurred. Um, looks like they're all within the same event date because again, we were interested in one sale. So we have June 1939. June 30th, 1939, under the event date here. And we can see that they were included in the same sales because the document includes the same, the same sale catalog number on the right-hand side under document. And it lists the lot numbers as well. And then, of course, you have the object titles that are located with the description. And you can view the record for each object on the left-hand side by selecting View. And this will take you to... Um, the sale profile for this particular painting, for example, in this uh, catalog. So we can see the, the sale document information, the lot number. We can see, so this is the artist we search for. This is Pablo Picasso. We can see that this is the object. 
that we were interested in, we can uh, take a look at that and also see uh, the transaction itself. So we can see the sale date, which we saw before, and we can see the sale location, which matches to what we were looking for in our search, and also that it was uh, the gallery Fisher which is where this particular auction we were looking for was held. So all of these are red lights, or um, I'm sorry, green lights for us, uh, I would say. But specifically, after you've kind of run through this information that's available through the provenance search, uh, you might want to also see the see also category all the way at the bottom and select catalog PDF. And this is going to take us to Heidelberg University to see a PDF of the catalog for this particular sale. So through the digitized content found in these catalogs, and we'll just select it here, uh, where it's beautifully digitized, um, we can actually see the sale contents um, and also annotations that might be handwritten on the sales catalogs um, that reveal prices, buyers, if not already known, and other relevant information. So this is really, um, this catalog uh, search is a great tool for private losses, which can sometimes be retraced with the help of historical sales catalogs like those found here. And then you can take this information and cross-reference it with corresponding business records and other sources like confiscation lists and even declarations of assets. Uh, next, we have NARA Fold 3 Military Records. So this is kind of shifting a bit. Um, I'm going to sign in here. And basically, Fold3 is a resource through Ancestry.com. You may have used it in the past for other, um, other objectives, but the Fold3 NAR military records actually provide access to important military records through a very unique partnership with the National Archives. And it allows users to access fully digitized Holocaust-era asset records held by NARA on microfilm. The only caveat is that users need to create a free account in order to access these digitized documents, um, but it's well worth it. Um, so I'll go ahead and sign in here. And it only takes a few minutes to do as well. So you can see now that we're logged in. Um, and this just gives you a brief overview on the NARA military records and the Holocaust era assets collections. Um, after the war, the US military set up several temporary collecting points in Germany. And these were in Marburg, Munich, Wiesbaden, and Offenbach in order to hash out looted art and try to investigate how to repatriate materials back to their countries of origin. But in doing so, they not only created administrative files for themselves, but they also collected administrative files related to looted art. So located on this page is some preliminary background information on the Holocaust records and also a keyword search here um, that will allow you to search through all of the NARA Holocaust related collections um, in one single search. It's a free text keyword search feature, um, but again, it is a single search. So if we wanted to do, for instance, uh, just one for um, a S Dre. This is a bit of a change. So instead of actually searching for um, an art object, let's say we're interested in searching for an Aryanized uh, German art dealer, art gallery um, by a dealer. Uh, A.S. Dre uh, owned a gallery in Munich, and then he emigrated to the United States in 36 and became a well-known dealer in New York City as well. Um, so by searching his name, for example, you can see um, all the different uh, documents that have been. Um, they are OCR documents from uh, the inventories from the military inventories. They come from multiple collections, and uh, the text is searchable here. So you can see if we just select this first document here, this is from the Roberts Commission, uh, which you might know as being uh, in coordination with the Monuments Men. If you select that, uh, you can zoom out a little bit. Um, it's very easy to navigate this as well. Uh, once you open up a resource and you can kind of see the information that's included in the card here. So we can see this is the former uh, owner of this gallery from Munich. It was Aryanized and who it was sold to as well and a little bit of information um, from that one collection. If we go back to the results list though, we can also see that the Gehring art objects, for example, 
from a different collection. This is the Ardelia Hall collection, also includes information from uh, A.S. Dre. It looks like this is a letter um, that concerns him from uh, Walter Bornheim, uh, who was, as we saw from the last document, the person who actually took over um, his firm once it was Aryanized. Uh, so this is just really good for looking at um, not just artworks, although you can search artworks here as well, um, but it's, it's general enough where you can even search individuals. So I definitely encourage you to um, use this resource in a lot of different ways. Next, we have the Jeux de Palm database. So the Jeux de, Jeux de Palm database, as we mentioned, uh, this institution was where the ERR was based during the occupation and where they documented a lot of the materials that they looted. Um, this database in particular is a collaboration between the Conference of Jewish Materials Claims Against Germany, uh, the Holocaust, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and also the WJRO. Um, but what's really interesting about this database is that this project actually digitized the ERR registration card files of French Jewish collections, which are currently held by NARA, because again, the monuments men are the ones who actually confiscated these cards. Um, but then those, uh, those listings are actually combined with the photographs that the ERR took of the same artwork. Um, but those photographs are actually held in the Federal Archives of Germany. So this database allows you to find um, information on uh, the person or an art object, and then to find the ERR cards, which are held by NARA, and also the photographs, which are held by the Federal Archives of Germany. And as we mentioned earlier, the ERR plundered art in many different regions, but this database in particular only covers documentation of artwork taken from France, Belgium, and then uh, the Netherlands. But what's really interesting about this database is that the results really represent tastes of collectors and specialists in mid-century Western Europe. Um, so before we go over the search, which is located just up top here in this navigation bar, I wanna highlight the browse feature. You can just kind of hover over. And this allows you to browse art owners and also art collections. And the main difference between the two is that some collections contain multiple owners uh, and also become some items were confiscated from dealers that were held on consignment uh, for other in individuals, for example. So if we were to select browse collections, for example, you can see information taken from the ERR cards. So you can see the collection name here. And you can see the corresponding code given to this collection by the ERR on the left-hand side. And these are all really good data points when you're trying to put together a collection um, or search a specific collection for an artwork you suspect may have been part of it um, or et cetera. So this does have a keyword search that you can use, um, but you can also do the same thing using a keyword or phrase search using the advanced search, um, using the any field um, at the top here. Um, but what's great about it is you can actually search by owner, uh, collection, uh, inventory number, and that's either if you are aware of the NARA inventory number or if you're interested in uh, the ERR inventory number, if you have that, you can search with that too. Um, the artist, uh, the title of the artwork, and any other sort of information like provenance you can search. But if we're interested particularly in a particular owner, for example, um, we can do, say we wanted George Wildenstein uh, in Paris. And let's say in particular, we're only interested in Fragonar pieces that maybe he held um, in his collection uh, or through his uh, gallery. You can also, you're welcome to fill in uh, other um, access points if you know them. But again, it's always better to start on the, um, the less kind of populated side just to kind of see the breadth of resources that are available through the results list. So we'll do a quick search here. And the results list is just going to appear just below the search fields. And you can see there's a card ID listing. There's also the title of an artwork, uh, the artist, and also the descriptions here. And you'll see these, and these will kind of be populated as much or as little according to the card from which they come from in the ERR inventory. So if we were to just select this first uh, result, we can see that it, this includes the collection it came from, the inventory number, uh, more information on this particular painting and the description. Uh, 
Also, the, uh, the literature that's associated with it. And just below the provenance and the archival resources, um, which the archival resources are, of course, added later. This is after the war. Um, but just under that, you can see the transfer place and transfer date, and also the repatriation date. So all of these are going to be compiled from both ERR uh, and uh, United States Army uh, listings and inventory. So all of these, all this information is going to actually come from the ERR cards, uh, or as I mentioned, those inventories uh, below. And you can see these and under the images, which are located all the way at the bottom. So you can see this is what uh, this is part of the NARA collection. This is what an ERR card would actually look like. So you can see that it says Fragonar at the top. Um, you can see that it actually does include a photo, um, although this is not part of this particular image. Um, again, this middle section is going to include the same descriptions that you see up at the top there. And then it's also going to include all the way in the left-hand corner, the bottom left-hand corner, um, when it entered the Reich and when it left the Reich, for example, or when it left uh, Paris and entered the Reich, for example. Uh, so we can see this is, I believe it says 43. And then corresponding, you can see that the Bundesarchive or the Federal Archive in Germany, uh, you can see these corresponding images that um, match the artwork that we see the description of right here. So overall, this is a great resource for kind of um, joining the two types of descriptions, particularly if you're interested in ERR confiscations um, in these areas in particular. I believe they're still adding to the database to add even more um, territories, um, but I don't think it's been updated yet. So right now it's still going to be uh, France and Belgium and also the Netherlands. Uh, and then very quickly, we'll just go over the Degenerate Art Database. And this is an index of degenerate art that was confiscated from German museums uh, in 1937 by the Reich Ministry of uh, Propaganda and the Reich's Culture Chamber. It was compiled by the Art History Department at the Freie University in Berlin. And the complete index is really based on the Nazi inventory of seizures, but also includes other degenerate artworks that were given by museums uh, to Nazi officials or that were seized without any sort of record from German museums at all. The list really stems from the estate of an Austrian art dealer named Heinrich Robert Fischer, who fled uh, to Great Britain in 1938. Um, so a lot of the listings that you'll find in this collection or this uh, database rather are from that inventory. But because it's specific to degenerate artworks that were taken from German museums, it also includes um, items that, had, that have been destroyed, um, not just that were confiscated and have been restituted or are still lost, but those that are documented or were documented by the Nazis as having been destroyed. Um, so you can see here, you do have the option again of a keyword search. Um, because this is coming from a, a known index that has been input into this database, this is essentially a database form of that index, um, you can use these drop down arrows here to specify a particular artist. We'll start with Joseph Albers. Um, and then if you're aware of any other um, information, these are all going to be in German, of course, because they're coming from the inventory. Um, but you can go ahead and, and select uh, either one of the categories for object types. But what I want to point out in particular is you can actually pinpoint loss through. So the loss through, you can choose um, loss through seizure, loss through uh, destruction, um, et cetera. For now, we'll leave this one blank. Um, but you can also choose different exhibitions. So you can choose anything by Joseph uh, Albers, for example, that was included, that you suspect was included in any one of these degenerate exhibitions that are listed here. Or you can just leave it blank as we'll do for the starter search. So here we can see there was about six located in this uh, inventory altogether. And if we select the first one, uh, again, it gives us information on the artwork itself, but it also gives us loss through seizure. Um, it tells us so the museum of origin, so where this was confiscated from. And then it also tells us the present status of this artwork in particular. So this one, we can see according to Nazi inventory, uh, it was destroyed. So this can really give us a good idea into artworks that are just no, no longer with us today.
And then a little bit further down, you have more artist and provenance information. Um, it gives you just when it was acquired by this museum and also when it was confiscated from the museum or seized, and then also associated artwork um, that was probably part of the group as well that was confiscated from the same museum. Uh, and then the very last one that we'll kind of go through is just the National Fund of the Republic of Austria. And this is an art database for the National Fund that provides information on art and cultural objects currently located in museums and collections in Austria or in Vienna in particular, um, which according to latest provenance research may have been seized during uh, or under Nazi rule. So this database really takes place in cooperation with federal museums and collections and with other Austrian institutions conducting provenance with an aim of determining whether or not there's possibility of restituting these objects from these collections. So you can do a full text search or a keyword search as we've seen with other databases before, but I want to draw your attention to if we just leave it blank and just select search, for example. So here, you don't necessarily need to actually add a keyword. And that is really because, I mean, you're more than welcome to if you're interested in finding a particular title or a particular artist that you're interested in um, from these Austrian museums. But I want to draw your attention specifically to the filters. So the filters in particular um, are helpful because users can select one or several museums. You can see here, you can select a different category if you want for the object or different types of objects you're interested in. You can select specifically the museums that you would like, that you would like to search the collections of that are participating. Um, also the material. Uh, you can also search by restitution status, uh, whether errors are being sought, as you can see here, restitution rejected, uh, research completed. And then all the way at the top, the, the provenance filters are really interesting. So you can see uh, what is included in these collections that have been purchased by a private institution, purchased from Julius Fargal. You can see this is a listing. He was somebody who was an art restorer who worked with uh, the, the Gestapo um, with uh, Austrian um, dealers. Uh, he also, or rather, there's also the purchase from the Dorotheum. Uh, from 1938 to 45, and uh, from the Dorotheum after 1945, um, and etc. cetera. Uh, so these are just kind of very different, different purchasings and different assignments that are uh, kind of questionable within some of their inventories for different uh, titles that you can just go ahead and select. Um, and if you were just to select one, for example, this will give you the list of entries that correspond to that particular filter. And then the Netherlands Art Property Collection is the very last one. This one actually fun functions the same way as the Austrian uh, art collections did. So we won't do any searches for these, but I just wanna show you from the search feature all the way in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that there is a search bar. You can search by um, terms uh, and keyword searches, but basically this is going to search um, provenance related to individual works of art in the Netherlands Art Property Collection which includes former looted Jewish properly, uh, property and voluntarily sold trade stock um, that had to do with Nazi persecution or Nazi confiscation. So there are about 3,800 3, items included in this database. And you can actually use these filters to search the very same way as the Austrian database. So by origin name, which is going to be collector's name on the, on the um, left-hand side, um, also filter by origin, so by place within the Netherlands and even by artist and object type and et cetera, as we've seen before. So again, this is coming from a specific inventory uh, from different collections held by the Netherlands Art Property Collection. So this is not going to search kind of generally. Um, again, a lot of these databases that are um, specific are searching from uh, found inventories of artworks. Uh, just to keep in mind, some databases are going to be for artworks that have not been restituted and are still missing. Um, they are going to have different objectives and aims. Some are going to be more for artworks that were missing and have since been restituted. And then some databases are going to include artworks that have been restituted and those that have not. So it really depends on the aim of the database that will help you choose which one's going to be the most helpful to you. 
Um, also, some, um, some databases are going to have more sophisticated searching parameters than others, while others are going to have multiple meanings for the same word, which is something to keep an eye out. Uh, so, for example, if you see a status that says not returned, this could mean not returned to the country of origin uh, or not returned to the um, the original owner, for example, um, and is thus currently held by public institutions in the country of origin, for example. So all of these terms are useful for familiar, familiarizing yourself with, and each of these databases are going to kind of use them in different ways as well. Also, provenance research is never fully complete. Uh, new information can always change old convictions. There are plenty of gaps to be filled. So that's just something to keep in mind when working on this type of um, this type of provenance work. And then further research strategies, uh, you want to make sure to check for gaps in ownership, specifically of certain gears. Um, you might have an idea of where an art fork came from, but you want to make sure you're searching uh, for or to the year in which that country was specifically became an occupied territory. So for example, Poland was 1938, but France was not until 1940. Um, but that's not to say there weren't sales made under duress outside of those years as well. Next, you want to make sure to search for red flag names. Uh, one great resource is the Biographical Index of Individuals Involved in Art Looting of the ALIU. Um, that's really great if you're interested in uh, individuals that were interrogated or investigated that were part of the art looting in different countries, different Nazi collaborators. Next, research the names of collectors or collections that have been known to be looted as well. This information can be found through resources on the ERR website or also the Fold3 database at NARA and even the Archives of American Art. Also, remember to cross-reference with information from multiple sources, not just databases and websites. Artworks will leave marks in exhibition catalogs, auction pamphlets, bills of sales, uh, photo archives, and also other sources as well. And these are just some additional resources that we have. Um, these are other nation-specific resources, national databases that are available from Germany, Switzerland, uh, Italy, and even the Russian Federation, which includes a catalog of art objects from Hungarian private collections. And then also some additional resources by country, um, but there's more than that as well. These are just some good ones of other projects that are currently being um, being undertaken at different uh, different institutions and kind of different partnerships and collaborations. So from there, uh, if you guys have any specific questions that you'd like addressed, please let me know. Uh, and we'll be happy to kind of address some of these questions that you might have or concerns in your own research. Hi, Michelle, thank you. Um, there are some questions that came in. Sure. Let's see. So one is, I'm very curious as to the role provenance plays in the search and restitution of Nazi looted art. My question stems from the looted Vincent van Gogh painting, Mille de Bleu, part of the Cox collection, soon to be sold at an upcoming Christie's auction. At the time of the sale, Mr. Cox might have been responsible for a search into the painting's provenance, or at the time of the purchase, was a provenance search not considered important? Or was it a lack of provenance research resources available, the challenge? Uh, that's a very, yeah, that's a very uh, involved kind of question. Um, without knowing a little bit more on the artwork uh, and the collection that it comes from, I'm not sure I can really comment much on it. Um, but I will say that usually auction houses, uh, they have all of this research, um, usually the resources that are available to them, and they work very hard to try to um, kind of find as much background as possible. Um, so it is possible there are also some gray areas, unfortunately, and you find this legally gray areas and you, uh, you find this with sales made under the duress, for example. Um, sales made under duress uh, are basically those of forced sales um, or coerced sales who, uh, for instance, might look legal on paper. But uh, given the circumstances or maybe um, going back so far as like uh, during the Nazi regime, um, looking at maybe how much an auction uh, or rather an artwork was sold for at auction kind of 
gives little red flags as to whether or not the sale was um, legitimate in so far as like the owner wanted to give it up uh, or again, was it coerced? Uh, but because there's sort of limited documentation in some of the sales made under duress as they're called, um, it takes a little bit more in-depth research. Uh, and again, this could vary by item, by dealer, by collector. Um, so it, it really depends on the case itself. That's a really great question though. And that's definitely not the only object that this, this comes up with. This also comes across with uh, museum collections as well who might want to restitute objects or heirs who might want to restitute objects for museum. Um, but that's a great question. Thank you. And um, I have, uh, would someone have been able to find out information on a painting if they, the Germans, had not kept such meticulous good records of what they looted and where it went? Uh, that's, that's a really good question, too. Um, luckily for us, the ERR and the Nazis did keep very meticulous records. So unfortunately, um, you know, that's not something, I don't want to say that's not something that we have to deal with because it definitely is because there are tons of cases also, I don't have an exact percentage, of course, uh, where we might not have any sort of documentation that the Nazis kept. Um, but from what they do kept, we're able to piece a lot together. And then from what the United States Army was able to kind of piece together from those ERR records as well. Um, but in the case where you don't find ERR records, for example, uh, or Nazi looting records at all, um, it does take a little bit more. And that's really where you want to focus um, in my experience. Although if others have any other recommendations, please feel free to add it to the chat as well. Um, you want to start with the person, um, if that's known, or the collector. Um, and these, this is really where genealogy databases and genealogy records, where you can kind of piece together the story of a person in, alongside their collection can be really useful in, in figuring um, this these types of information out um, for sure. So I hope that's helpful. Um, again, a lot of these are, are kind of case by case basis as well. Wonderful. Uh, someone is asking if we could please list the web addresses for the databases. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, so this is actually going to be recorded and posted to the explore section of the Frick.org website. Um, and on there is where we have uh, the links to all of the databases. Um, they won't be clickable because it'll be a recording, but they will be listed there, the HTML, with each slide. And um, someone is asking... Oops. What percentage of artworks were usually sold within the first years they were looted? Uh, that I would say would depend on the type of artwork um, that was confiscated or taken. Um, in terms of degenerate art, uh, I believe some of the larger ones were in the 1930s or 1938, but I don't know offhand uh, the percentage itself. Um, if you're interested in discussing that further, you can email us libraryfrick.org and we can just discuss a little bit more. Um, but a direct percentage, uh, I believe a lot of the looting um, and a lot of the confiscations took place within a particular time frame. I want to say it was within the first uh, two years of the war, um, but I would need to double check those figures. Would you have time for two more questions? <laughs> Sure. Yes, absolutely. And cool. also Lorenzo just dropped the evaluation form into the yeah. chat as well. Yes. And uh, which most famous art objects with unknown provenance from Germany are in the museums in New York City? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of this research is still currently being done and it's it's a never ending process. I mean, we're still finding gaps in provenance. Uh, what I would suggest if you are interested in that topic is there's a great database. We didn't cover it today, but it's a United States specific database um, by the Association of uh, Museums in the United States. Uh, so if you do a search for that, I can actually find it and drop it into the chat. Um, but that will actually list, it'll be um, very similar to the 
the national inventories that we just saw that where they start looking at museum inventories of questionable uh, provenance, that um, database will actually do a search uh, listing of United States museums where you can actually focus on New York City, for example, um, I believe. Uh, so that would probably be the best route to go if that's, an, if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, let me try and find that link and I'll drop it right into the chat for you. So I'm have I can't find it uh, quickly right now uh, just because I don't want to hold up another question. But uh, if you email us library at frick.org, I will definitely send you the link to that resource because that looks like something that would be exactly what you're looking for. Okay, there's two more questions. Um, in the case of destroyed artifacts, what's the level of confidence that this is actually the case? Um, I would say this depends on uh, where you're finding that status. Uh, if you're finding it towards, um, for instance, that degenerate art database that we looked at before by the Fry University, um, that's going by actual, um, that's going by Nazi inventory statuses for the object. So this is what they um, kind of, uh, these are them documenting their actions for a particular work of art or a particular artist, for example. Um, so it, it depends on the source. Uh, there are plenty of resources though, or rather not resources. And that's kind of the sad part is that we can't always check is if something was looted, for example, um, looting just didn't occur during World War II from the Nazis. It also came from both sides, allied forces, also some of the Soviet troops as they were kind of coming through, as I mentioned, uh, when we were talking about um, the lost art database for uh, German collections, a lot of the Soviet troops were coming across occupied territories and kind of taking what they saw as trophy art to um, kind of uh, as payback for some of the lives lost in the war that were the atrocities committed by the German against their people. So there are some objects that have been looted um, that uh, are suspected to also be uh, in Russia, different uh, Russian museums that maybe we don't have access to. Um, but it, that depends on, again, the territory it came from, the artwork. Uh, there are registers of artwork still missing that you can find um, in a variety of different places. Uh, several were put together immediately. Uh, the Frick, uh, Art Reference Library, for instance, has um, uh, a listing of artworks that was put together, I believe, in 1946 of uh, unaccounted for artworks as well. Um, so there are, there are many different types of cases. So I would suggest... Um, kind of poking through, trying to find some of these inventories because there are definitely listings for that as well. And some of them may have been restituted since then. Um, but it, yeah, it depends on the source that says the status of the object. And uh, there was a comment that we should all be grateful to Rose Valand who, tra who tracked artworks and fooled the Nazis. Yes, yeah, there's a lot of a uh, lot of individuals um, who played their part in uh, kind of working undercover. So definitely hats off to them. You're right. Thank you. And just uh, for the last one, um, thank you for a wonderfully informative talk. I'm very interested in the looted art that was trafficked via neutral countries mm -hmm. towards Latin America. Do you know of any specific resources for this? Thank you. Uh, looted artwork that were trafficked to South America. Um, that I don't know offhand. That's not something that um, I've done any research on um, personally, but um, I know, I apologize, I keep saying this just for the, the amount of kind of short time that we have left for questions, but if you email library at frick.org, I'm sure we can find some uh, inventories or some websites, uh, yeah, either in museums or maybe even private collections that have since been kind of come to light that we can kind of discuss and find. Um, but that's a really great question. I think there's definitely more research to be done in that area. That looks to be it. Thank you. <laughs> great. Well, uh, it's 510 now. Thank you all so much for being part of this talk. Uh, again, please fill out the evaluation form and let us know what you'd like to see for future programs um, and anything else that you think might be helpful for this talk. Um, 
And uh, that's about it. If you have any other questions or comments, please feel free to reach out library at frick.org. Uh, and we hope to hear from you soon. Have a great rest of your night.